So I dove right into using 3D modeling software like Rhinoceros, Revit, SketchUp, um, AutoCAD. I was using laser cutters and 3D printers and my mind was kind of blown at being able to iterate in such a short period of time, going from a design to implementation and creation. And at the same time, I was taking these biology classes, these neuroscience classes, and seeing a very direct link between these two of how the natural systems, the human systems, the you know much larger scale systems of evolution and development, and how that is reflected in the built environment. Hey everyone, thanks for listening to another episode of Building 2.0. Today, I'm speaking with Amy Scott, VDC engineer at Turner Construction. Amy, thanks for chatting with me today. Thanks for having me. Very excited to chat. Before diving into buildings, I want to hear about your biology background. So uh, how did you decide to start with biology? That is, is a very good question, one I definitely get often. So not to make it too long, but uh, going into the college search process, I born and raised in South Africa. I lived there for the first 20 years of my life. Um, I was a very good student um, in high school, and I was really interested in the field of biomedical engineering uh, because it really combined my interest and love and passion for helping people with you know, engineering and art and design. So that's really what I thought I wanted to do. South Africa didn't have a lot of biomedical engineering programs. Uh, there weren't a lot of opportunities. A few colleges had programs, but they were very new. And going into that kind of field that is so innovative, that is so cutting edge, I wanted to be more immersed in folks who had a more robust experience and background in it. So with that in mind, and then also keeping in mind that colleges very expensive. And I come from a fairly low income background in South Africa. I got to work researching where I could go, where the opportunities for funding are, uh, where the best research opportunities, et cetera, were. And that led me on a kind of winding two-year journey while um, where I was working after high school, a myriad of different jobs, figuring out more about what I liked, what I was interested in, um, and doing this in a fairly unconventional way. I was teaching or coaching rather, field hockey. I was a barista. I was an au pair. Uh, I worked as a sales and marketing rep for a craft brewery, which was one of my favorite jobs. And in between that, I did a three-month solo backpacking trip through the U.S., really focusing in the Northeast because there's so many good colleges there and there's a lot of funding available. There's a lot of scholarship money, uh, the merit scholarships. There is financial need-based um, awards. And as I was searching, I was learning so much more about myself and also, you know, what would biomedical engineering really entail and and what would studying that entail and seeing the liberal arts college system versus a a more traditional college experience or college degree at an R1 research university. I was really excited about being able to pursue multiple different things. And so I ultimately chose a liberal arts college. I went to Wesleyan University where I was very fortunate to get a full ride. And I knew I had this interest in biology and, you know, the body and its systems. And so my freshman year, I, you know, took bio 101 because that's kind of what you do if you you want to go into biology. And at that point, I still thought I would do biomedical engineering. So I'd do, you know, a three, two engineering program, something of the sort. But at the same time, I took a fresh, well, it wasn't a freshman class, but I kind of insisted my way into it. It was a class called Digital Fabrication, and it was computer-based modeling and product development, essentially. So I dove right into using 3D modeling software, like Rhinoceros, Revit, SketchUp, um, AutoCAD. I was using laser cutters and 3D printers, and my mind was kind of blown at being able to iterate in such a short period of time, going from a design to implementation and creation. And at the same time, I was taking these biology classes, these neuroscience classes, and seeing a very direct link between these two of how the natural systems, the human systems, the you know much larger scale systems of evolution and development, and how that is reflected in the built environment. So 
the biomedical engineering really fell away as my passion for design and development and real life problem solving. Being able to leverage these two different things, learn from the biological world, like apply it in the built environment and and kind of go from there. Double click on that. So the human body has its own systems. And I think your background in biology, I can naturally see how it begins to inform how you think about buildings. I mean, what is the link now that you're on the ground working on projects? Give us a sample. It's like what kinds of projects you're working on and how, you know, you link kind of human body systems with what's going on buildings today. For me, the most like basic comparison of a side by side of a building and a body, and I think it's a fairly common analogy, is is your different mechanical systems. So your neurological system in the body, your brain and your neurons, um, that is your electrical system. That's what keeps the building smart. And that's really the part that I'm most interested in is the coming from the BIM world is is the smart part of the building and how we can have a centralized Uh, location for the data and for the different functionings of the body. Buildings aren't quite at the level of humans yet, um, of, you know, living, breathing animals, but I don't think we're that far off. We then have our respiratory system in the body, you know, your lungs, your breathing, and in a building, that's all your air handling units, that's your HVAC, that's getting clean air from the outside, pumping it into the building, making sure that it's uh, the right level, the right temperature and then pumping it back out again and keeping our new and innovative buildings really fresh and clean and free of, you know, sediment or particulate in the air. Um, Our, you know, circulatory system and digestive systems, that's your your M-wet, your wastewater, your chillers and your coolers. So for me, it's it's very direct. And in thinking about it, I, I really like drawing inspiration from not just how human bodies are, you know, designed, but trees with xylem and phlegm channels, other animals, creatures, um, you know, there's such a range. You have your warm-blooded and your cold-blooded, you have your reptiles, amphibians, you have some exoskeletons, you have regular skeletal systems like a human. So like where are you getting your structure from? Where are you getting that integrity and that support? Where are you getting that barrier to the water? Does it have to be on the outside of your body? Does it have to be on the outside of the building? Could it be more internalized? And then in that case, you maybe have more of an indoor outdoor space on the perimeter um, that allows for this more natural flow of in indoor to outdoor space, etc. So mm-hmm. How I think about these different things and how they relate really depends on, you know, am I thinking with a designer mind? Am I thinking with um, a construction mind? And what what problem am I trying to solve for? Am I trying to solve for clash detection and coordinating MEPs before we build? Am I trying to solve for getting the most value for a client by pushing for prefabrication? Um, so they just, uh, it, it is such a such a big scope. And it really is up to, you know, the specific constraints of that problem or that situation to determine what lens you look through and then how you draw from previous experience or other buildings or precedent to correct for that. I absolutely love this framework. You know, this is more of a comment than a question, but, you know, unlike the human body where, you know, if we take good care of it or rather if we don't, it it affects us. You know, what keeps me up at night is that like with buildings, they're at the center of like some of our biggest challenges, like like as 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 a society, right? Like being the number one emitters of CO2 in the environment suggests that we need to do things about even just our existing buildings. When you have to dig in deeper into this challenge, uh, what are some of the building systems that are causing harm? And how can we like double click into these? Or is it in fact like the respiratory systems of these buildings that are primary culprits? That's tough. I I don't know if there's if there's one primary culprit. Um, th- there are a few different things. If we if we start from existing buildings, you have your embodied carbon, which is it's too late to do anything about that. The building is built. And then you have your active carbon. I'm sure. There is a better word for it. I know that there's a better word for it, but but let's say active carbon. And that is, as you say, how much electricity are you using? What kind of exhausts are you putting out into the world? What kind of, 
you know, chemicals or toxins, especially if you're a, a manufacturing plant, less so if you're a commercial or residential building. And there are ways to reduce that. There are ways to retrofit to make buildings closer to the passive housing or solar housing models, where if you're choosing the right materials, if you're, you know, you're retrofitting a brownstone in Brooklyn, making sure that those windows are airtight, you can do a lot of studies on um, where you're actually losing that air. And that way you can patch those cracks of those buildings that have been here for 100 years or 60 years or 40 years. Um, you can get better insulation. There's this incredible new mycelium-based insulation, which is mushroom and fungus-based, essentially, that insulates at, you know, three to four times um, greater efficiency than the um, insulation that we've been using. And it's cheaper. It's sustainable. It saves you in the long run on your heating and cooling costs massively. So doing things like that to existing buildings, it's it's not just how much electricity are you using, use a more energy efficient AC unit. Um, it's also what is currently in the building and what are those kind of active things that do require an upfront cost, you know, solar panels, et cetera. Um, and I think that's really where individual and you know, kind of political policy will need to align better. If you have incentives for folks to use solar, if you have um, tax breaks or similar to the stimulus checks during COVID, once off payments that can alleviate that cost burden of retrofitting buildings, et cetera. Because that has an environmental benefit. It has a safety benefit. It has a quality of life benefit. It saves the on the pockets of regular citizens and of landlords and tenants. And then if you scale that up all the way to the commercial side, your operating costs are going to be so much lower over the life of your building. Um, if you're leasing, you know, 350,000 square feet of commercial office space, your like heating and cooling bills will be so much lower if that developer has chosen smarter materials um, and has invested in really what's best for, you know, overall ESG goals, people, planet, profit. So yeah. that's kind of existing buildings and retrofitting. And then looking at new construction, it's really in, in the materials you're buying. It's in looking at that embodied carbon. It's being ambitious and striving for lead status for well buildings for the living building challenge and and it is a challenge it is a challenge but i do think that enough people really care about this and really want their environment to be to to reflect their personal values and to make them feel good every day and these updated more innovative materials lead to better spaces where we feel more well where we get more daylight where the air is cleaner um, you're not going hot cold throughout the day because the mechanical systems are outdated. So it really is a win-win. And I just, I think, I think we're not that far from a waterfall of all these changes happening and rolling out. And we've seen with local law 97, um, amongst many other fantastic um, policies here in New York and across the country and across the world, that 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 political will and you know individual will, it's it is coming together and is aligning. What's the role of BIM uh, relative to the political new legislation and all the different stakeholders? Like what what is BIM uniquely positioned to do to help in this, you know, kind of perfect storm of of uh, conditions? The way I see it, which, you know, could be very different than than the way other people see it, is that we are kind of the centralized locus of the, especially if you're BIM from a con construction or contractor perspective, you are the locus of all this information, of hearing all the different opinions, challenges, perspectives of the trades, the client, the owner, um, the future tenants, because we can imagine ourselves in these buildings, you know, once they're complete. And having all of this information in a centralized place, you're then much better positioned to, you know, use something like predictive analytics or risk management, and to understand how the ecosystem really comes together, where the points in the chain are weaker and could be improved, um, whether that's from a 
sustainability or carbon emissions perspective, whether that's from a communication perspective. Uh, and there's really great legislation in place in Europe right now that requires BIM from the architect point, from that design point, all the way through to close out, and then really pushing into the digital twin space, which is a the point that I'm really excited about because that's where you, especially over time, will get this these metrics. And so using BIM to, from the beginning, you know, tracking the design changes from the architectural point of view when you're going from, you know, schematic design to shop drawings. All of that has iterations. You see the decisions made along the way. Using BIM and tagging and AI in this, you know, really incredible creative way, you can see what is driving these changes. Is it cost? Is it uh, wanting to be more sustainable? Um, is it a change in the market? Because often design is is over a scale of years, an order of years. And then once you've designed that and you're good to go, you have your contractor, you've bought your trades, you're commissioning the different products to be brought to site, like just in time to keep it lean, then where are you slipping up? What is causing a scheduling delay? How can you be more efficient? How can you save on, you know, logistics costs, et cetera? And so using tagging of your different items to track exactly how long it takes to go from the factory to be installed on site, how the weather and the climate is affecting that when you have a really hot summer, when you have a really cold winter, when you have more rain than expected. Being able to use all of this data to see how it affects, you know, over the lifespan of that construction portion, that concept to completion portion, and then afterwards. Because as we've, you know, mentioned before, having those as bolts, whether you're retrofitting or whether you're doing a new building, Having that accurate digital twin picture, image, 3D model of the building that you're working with, that you're occupying, you can then measure all of these different systems, localize them in the BMS or, you know, the brain of the building. And from there, whether you're the developer, whether you're the tenant, whether you're just an occupant of that building, there's so much information that you're getting about how efficient these systems are and predicting when you will really need to change your climate conditions. Um, when is your occupancy higher or low? And it's not just about when people are swapping in, it's holidays, it is the weather, it is changes in something like congestion pricing in New York City, which has unfortunately been put on an indefinite hold. How would that have affected the occupancy of buildings. And from there, gathering this data and building up a history, you can then predict future trends in office occupancy or in traffic because you're knowing how, you know, how dense a city is and where those densities are localized. People are getting there some way, somehow. Maybe you need to change train schedules. Maybe you need to consider different traffic regulations. And um, there's so many things that our buildings then have a ripple effect on and can inform us on um, elsewhere. And that can really track our carbon emissions, et cetera, as well. That can track how satisfied people are in their buildings. Are they more productive because they're in a better environment? And it's not this old building that is pumping in, you know, poor quality air and they have low light and they're sitting at stationary desks and, you know, don't have those spontaneous meetings on these beautiful feature stairs that are a big trend. So BIM to me is that brain that brings everything together and then outputs a lot of different suggestions about how we can continue to improve and do better. So to paint the scenario, so I am a developer and I have just acquired a really tall building in New York City, uh, 200,000 square feet and it's 20 floors. And the premise is that it's a underutilized building, so commercial office, mm -hmm. and I need to figure out what to do with it. Now, all I know as an owner is that I've heard about this BIM stuff, and it sounds like a lot of acronyms. And um, how should I think about the acquisition process? And what questions do I need to start asking to set up this acquisition and then potential renovation for success? Um, and how do I even start to ask the right questions about BIM and who to 
what kind of dots to connect between architects, engineers, and builders? That's a great question. In my opinion, you start asking those questions before you buy that building. But if you're doing it after the fact, that's still, you know, better late than never. The, the way I would approach this is I would bring in an architect that has a robust BIM team and has a really good understanding um, of how BIM impacts everything from design to then, you know, that post-occupancy life of the building. And there are some incredible architectural firms that have this. Um, and by having that BIM understanding from the beginning, from that design phase, when you're thinking about how to better utilize this, this building that you're going to develop, you've got the design side and the innovation, the creativity from, you know, how can we make this building beautiful and appealing and a desirous place to enter and occupy? Then you also have this understanding of the mechanicals, the actual functions of the building, the cost that goes into it, and really that sustainable, the sustainable aspect and the sustaining the life of the building over a number of years in terms of that utilization rate. How can we keep this building relevant and the spaces within it relevant to people who'd want to use it? Uh, so you'd be able to look at things like ground floor retail and how that revitalizes an area, a space, how it is such a draw for folks in the building to be able to pop downstairs, get their coffee or, you know, get drinks after work or do quick shopping on their way home without detouring, you know, three subway stops or a 30 minute car ride, whatever that may be. And then really understanding and knowing the trends of that city, of that region, and, and with BIM, especially if you're an owner, you can connect, you could have a hundred buildings across four different cities. And if you have a digital twin, if you're using BIM and not just BIM, but other things that we've discussed, you know, you're using AI, you're collecting this historical data from occupancy and you're looking at market trends and you're taking advantage of the big data world that we live in at the moment to see what are the trends in these cities? How have my other buildings been performing? What aspects are really working? Um, what are these architects who are really have their finger on the pulse of trends and design? Like we're really leaning into this world of like neuro-based design, how our brains respond to the environment that we're in um, and how can we use that and use more empirical based things rather than just, you know, this looks beautiful, but does it actually work for the people in it? Mm. Using that empirical data to then ensure on all fronts, you know, maximum return on that investment in terms of, you know, how much are you spending and what are you going to be able to get out of it um, in terms of leasable space? How can it be as sustainable as possible? Because that also plays into the ROI. You're, you're going to be a more desirable um, building to tenants and to occupants if you are sustainable, um, especially newer generations. That's a huge emphasis. Um, folks is purchasing decisions. Right. And then how do you keep it adaptable and versatile? What kind of spaces are we needed? Because we have, we're coming from the space of thinking, you know, we have 200 personnel, we need 200 desks. But we're realizing more and more with hybrid and within regular office spaces that people work very differently. You have that person who's zoned in and clocked in at their desk, eight or five, they're you know coding away or whatever they're doing, they're kind of in that one spot the whole day. Then you have other folks who work differently or their functions really uh, result in them you know kind of being at one desk, but then they're in meetings half the day, scattered around the buildings. Some of them are phone calls, some of them are hybrid. They're having a meeting you know at, at a central cafeteria or in the base of the building where there's a you know local coffee shop. And that occupancy then looks different because you've got a computer at one desk, but you're physically occupying a different space. So help me kind of bridge this gap. So I know generally BIM is the way to go, but if I were to say, look, I'm I'm acquiring this building, I've got a series of landlord CAD drawings from, from the previous owner. I kind of know they're okay. They're probably a little bit out of date. Is that not good enough? Or am I thinking about the challenge in, in the wrong way? I think it's it's about what you're trying to get out of it. If you're just trying to complete construction, you have your architect come in, 
design based on those as builds, doing some verification in the field, get it done. You you can do that. Is it going to be the best approach in the long term? Are you going to be able to get the most out of that space moving forward? Are you going to run into schedule delays because of all of these unknowns, because those as builds are not as accurate as you think they are? Those are all different, you know, risks and calculations you've got to take. And a lot of it comes down to scale. If you're doing a two floor interior fit out in a relatively new building, that impact, the scale of that impact of using BIM is going to be a lot less. If you're building a new building or you're retrofitting a whole building, uh, you're repositioning a whole building, the impact of not using BIM and not using this technology is going to be felt on your pockets and it's going to be felt on the desirability of that building moving forward. Uh, because if I'm a tenant in that space and I then want to make changes, you know, 10 years into my lease, and I don't have accurate information to use, or the building keeps running into issues because it wasn't well designed as you were integrating these newer mechanicals into existing systems, um, and they weren't updated as much as they should have been, and you aren't aware of where the issues are. With a with a BIM model, with digital twin, with using all of this information that is like really on hand as a tenant or as a developer, as an owner, you're, you're shooting yourself in the foot because you're denying yourself that data and that ability to then be agile and adaptable to change mm -hmm. and to proactive repairs and proactive and preventative maintenance rather than, you know, a generator fails in the middle of a power outage. And you could have, you could have been on top of that, but instead you have a, major repercussion cost-wise and in terms of the satisfaction of your tenants and with a little bit of earlier investment and force fat that could have been avoided. So help me through this. One of the many acronyms that I've heard is LOD. So yes. I'm going to paint the picture. I've got facilities teams, I've got design and, and construction teams, and my facilities needs, you know, they tell me things like LOD 400, 450 design teams, you know, giving me different numbers. How do I make sense of this? Great question. So LOD is level of development. And that's really just, you know, how detailed is this document? And that document could be a two-dimensional document. It could be a 3D model. But how detailed in it is it? How much information is it? And depending on what the scope of your work is and what the ambitions of the project are, you'll want... Or, or need rather a certain level of development. If it's a pretty simple interior fit out, high end finishes, but nothing crazy. It's, you know, office space, it's maybe a cafeteria. So you have some kitchen equipment, you have your regular IT and, you know, data, internet, wireless equipment needed. You don't need to go crazy on your level of development, um, especially if you have a really good communicative team of your, you know, architect, your trades, and then your contractor, you can get away with, you know, an LOD 200. But if you're building a hospital, if you're tying into an existing building that has been renovated multiple times, you really want that level of development to be higher because the details, the information that you'll have to then spot problems before they become a problem, do better clash detection, uh, ensure that when you, you know, sign off on major ductwork to be done, you're not then installing it, getting to a point where now it's not fitting and aligning with the rest of the mechanicals. You have to then redesign, you have to re-sign off, get that built again, and suddenly you have a six-week delay in your schedule when that information could have been gathered prior and you could have addressed that issue ahead of time. So it really depends on, you know, what your constraints are too. Maybe you only have six weeks to turn something around, in which case, you know, you go with whatever LOD you have. Unfortunately, it is really dependent on, on the project, on the client, on, you know, the scope of work, et cetera. I've, I've noticed that depending on the, you know, the different teams, different firms, different trades, different scopes, you know, one team might use BIM, another team might use CAD, another team might use something else. You know, I don't know. 
how do I think about that? Like to make make sure that folks are hopefully speaking the same language. And mm -hmm. as an owner, how do I make sure that that's the case? I think it really comes down to language and and having a shared vocabulary or or a shared playbook, so to speak, because. Folks often, you know, not just in the architecture, engineering, construction world, but in life will use very similar words to describe the same thing. And in certain contexts, it's, it's understood that you're talking about the same thing, but in another context, another person could completely misinterpret it because they wouldn't use that same word or they have a different understanding of that word. So establishing from the beginning, whether that's in your contract language, whether that's in your kickoff meeting, but establishing that terminology from the beginning because communication is so critical. I think that's the first step. It's really understanding and knowing that, you know, what is BIM? BIM is building information modeling. It is a tool. It, it's not a thing. A thing would be like the 3D model, but without information, it's just a 3D model. Once you input that information, once you increase that LOD, it becomes a building information model but it's still then just a tool. It's how you use it after the fact. CAD is computer-aided design or computer-aided drawing. So that's a software or that's you know a method of drawing. We're not using pen and paper. We're using a computer to do this design. So it, just understanding kind of the nuances and and I think we're in a we're in a decent place in construction right now where uh, there is a pretty good understanding of when people use things interchangeably, you know, BIM or CAD or et cetera, there's, there's an understanding of what you're meaning. But ask that question if you're not sure, if you don't know, if you're that owner, we're, you know, each of us has our areas of expertise and I'm not expecting you to know my job in and out and in the same way I don't know yours. So always ask the question and and that goes, you know, for within the design team as well, if I'm an architecture firm talking to a trade, talking to a VDC engineer on the GC end, I want to make sure that I know exactly what you're saying. So when you're saying, hey, Amy, can you boom this, which I get asked all the time, I I know from the folks that I'm working with that what you're really meaning is, can I model this in 3D or can I perform clash detection on this? Because I have that knowledge of the context and all those individuals asking me the question. When I'm working with a new team, if you say, Amy, can you boom this? I don't, I don't know exactly what you mean. So, so I will follow up and I'll ask, you know, wh what is it that you want from me? What is that need? Um, what is my deliverable specifically? Is this a 3D model? Is it a report? Um, is it an assessment of the LOD? Et cetera. Help me understand further. So from your side of the table as a VDC engineer, your role while you're using BIM, I guess, like the design professionals, you're perhaps on the receiving end of some of this information from design professionals. What is like, what's your day-to-day -day look like in the receiving end? And then like what you're able to actually um, create? So it depends what hat I'm wearing within my day-to-day. -day. So my role includes laser scanning and registration and alignment of those scans, which could then lead to creation of heat maps or doing scan to BIM. I could also be in more of a pre-construction role, which means I am helping develop our approach to constructing that building. Where are we putting our cranes, our sidewalk sheds, our protection, and, and modeling that in-house um, to then be able to extract quantities to help with our estimates, to help with our purchasing and our overall, you know, functioning as a general contractor of, you know, buying trades and and organizing the ultimate goal of getting this building done because the architect has gone to the effort of designing it. The engineer has figured out how to make it stand up. And now we need to figure out, um, especially here in New York with very little space, um, very tight constraints in terms of the DOT, the DOB, like how do we actually get this done when you can't put three cranes on Fifth Avenue? You can't even put one crane on Fifth Avenue. So physically, how are we going to get this executed? So in that role, I'm the one who's modeling the existing conditions, the surrounding site, the logistics equipment. And oftentimes we're presenting this to the client and saying, look, this is how we're going to get this done. And this is how we're going to execute this, you know, better and more efficiently than a competitor. 
and hey, we've done this seven times before on different projects in these different regions. This is what we've been able to achieve in terms of cutting down schedule or, you know, increasing value. So that's sort of sort of in the pre-construction world. In the construction space, well, the the building is under construction, we have broken ground, then my role as a coordinator is to get the architectural design model, get the trade models your, from your electrician, from your plumber, from your duct worker, et cetera, and bring this all together. And that's almost always the first time that those different drawings and documents are coming together in the same space. So that's, you know, calling back to that that nucleus, that brain of that construction, now that it's in the same place, is it working? Is it aligning? Do you have electrical conduit going through ductwork, which in the virtual space, that can work. But when you have your physical building, that is a physical impossibility. So that's the point at which I come in and solve those problems. So that process is called clash detection. It is a conversation. It is uh, problem solving. It is designing uh, for efficiency and optimization um, and saying, hey, look, there are 400 clashes in this 27-story building. There would be way more in a 27-story building, but let's say there are 400. And, you know, 150 of them are electrical and plumbing clashes. So this is, you know, these are the constraints we're working with. This is us healing height, each different, you know, fan box and, you know, certain pipe has its individual constraints in terms of what angle does it need to be at? Does it, how close does it need to be to venting? How far away does it need to be from a sprinkler head, et cetera? You go off and, and redesign that. And then the, you know, remaining 250 clashes are architectural elements or are X or Y. And so it's a it's a large group conversation, but it's also one-on-one -on -one conversations between those trades that are clashing with the architect and the owner, because maybe these clashes are consistently an issue of ceiling height, in which case, if we just drop the ceiling height by three inches, will this solve 300 of our problems? Is that the most efficient way forward? But maybe the owner or client really you know, their bottom line, their line in the sand is ceiling height. They've advertised 15 foot ceiling heights, not, you know, 14 and a half foot ceiling heights. So then we go ahead with that. That's what my day to day would look like while on a coordination project. So, I mean, your day to day is everything from speaking with clients to project managers to, to estimators, procurement, and it seems like even coordinating subs. I mean, I'm, I'm curious, just who do you find maybe anecdotally are some of the players that are most receptive to this? I mean, is you've mentioned things like quantification, like is this a game changer for PMs or estimators? Like who, who's asking you for more of this uh, proactively? Everyone. I work with folks in you know different departments all the time because I I'm fortunate to be able to work on you know um, sales pursuits and and respond to RFPs in collaboration with our fantastic business development team, um, and it means that I hear from the pre construction team from estimating purchasing etc. And I also hear from the business development team you know what are the clients looking for and and each client is slightly different, but there is a consistency in this interest in BIM, this interest in virtual design and AI and optimization pretty much across the board. So I have folks in the estimating department saying, hey, Amy, if you have a model of this, is there an easy way to you know, count the number of windows, count the number of doors, et cetera, and then you know, export that data into an Excel so that you know, the traditional means of estimating and how you'd go about quantifying you know, each type of asset within a project will very shortly become redundant. And that'll mean that we can produce estimates more quickly, more efficiently. We will still need to, you know, there are always caveats and there's always, this is what the design has. But from our experience, we know that we typically end up using less of this or using more of this. But it can be implemented within the estimating space. It can be within project management. When they can see a three-dimensional model of this building, um, what it looks like right now, what needs to be demolished, what needs to be installed, what the surrounding site conditions are and the traffic. 
a lot of people are very visual learners and it's incredibly powerful how really early on in the construction stage, seeing it in this way, in this novel way and being able to manipulate and interact with this model in such a tangible way will spark these light bulbs and have PMs asking questions of saying, this was my assumption, but seeing it this way, I'm realizing that is not going to work. Or I'm seeing how similar this is to a project I did 15 years ago, where our solution after a lot of struggle was X. Let's just start with that because it's the same conditions and using X type of crane instead of Y type of crane or, you know, pre-building these elements is going to save us three months, whatever it is. So really is from, from all different sides. And my hope is that VDC isn't a department. BIM isn't a department. It is, as I said, it's just a tool. So everyone from PMs to estimators to purchases to the trades, et cetera. Everyone's just using this incredible tool the same way we'll all be using AI to design better, optimize better, and, you know, build build a better environment and build a better world with more climate-friendly, uh, more people-friendly, more, you know, green space and urban-friendly than we have been doing. You mentioned uh, a little while ago the importance of of language and making sure that we're using the same things. I mean, is it is it quite as simple as the fact that BIM just enables us to just just see in more contextual like three D versions or you know one D, and it just it's easier for us to have those eureka moments like oh I get it now it's this is what it looks like then perhaps we've been we haven't enjoyed in a two D space you know I guess in the last few decades we've been so kind of CAD oriented and 2D is it is it really just as simple as just like better context visually I think that's a big part of it and that's the 3D model part of it but to me the real core and the crux of you know virtual design and construction is is that BIM portion that building information modeling portion because a 3D model is really pretty and it's fun and it's cool and you know wow I just like created from this virtual blank canvas, I modeled a 37 story high rise in Brooklyn in you know, three days and it's amazing. But what are we doing it? What are we doing with it? And what is it doing for us? And that is that BIM portion that is inputting inform information and data that's using that model to extract quantities and weights and perform, you know, simulated integrity tests um, and heat load, cooling load tests to make sure that our MVP systems are the best that they can be um, and are optimal for that building. It's using it during the process of construction for tracking and tagging, you know, the install process and knowing that you're keeping to schedule um, and keeping track of, of these literally millions of moving parts. And then once that building's built, you have this model with all this information, continue to input more model, extract data from these different systems and, and use that predictive maintenance, that predictive analytics. It, it really is, um, it is in that information portion of it that I think the game really changes. Amy, this has been so much fun. I can imagine we could do a part two on any one of these subjects. I do have to let you go. Uh, for folks that do want to follow your work and your team's work, uh, where can they find you guys? Turner Construction has a fantastic website. Um, you can literally just Google, you know, Turner Construction. Otherwise, you can follow me on LinkedIn, um, Amy Scarp. Otherwise, I don't actually use any other social media. I'm, I'm a big I'm a big in-person person, uh, despite my virtual design and construction role. But you can also find me probably speaking at New York Build next year. I spoke this year. I've been on a few podcasts or different panels, um, but there are really great resources beyond me out there as well, if you're just curious enough to find them. Really excited to have you as part two. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.